So if we look at the role for the pharma industry in this, is this fundamentally going to change the drug development process? I believe it will. I believe it already has. Um, we are looking, of course, at AstraZeneca at 80% um, of our drugs in the, in the pipeline following a personalised healthcare approach. That's not just oncology, that's all of our drugs. And I, don't thi I think that's a high proportion for pharma, but it's not unusual. I think there may will be other farmers that have the same. And that then changes the whole way we do drug development having that patient selection paradigm in our clinical trials, allowing for the, the biomarker testing, the, all the infrastructure that we've been talking about, and the transmitting of biomarker data, that's a big change to how we do business. And I think it will make us much more patient-centric. So this is a great model for, for patients, you know, more tightly defined patient populations, better testing, in theory, better drugs that, that are more efficacious. It's a challenge commercially because the drug development costs don't necessarily decrease proportionate to the patient populations. And we're talking here about the whole issue of who pays for all this. How do we tackle some of those issues? We're living in a world where there are generic drugs available that are effective, as we heard earlier, and that are much cheaper than the novel drugs that are coming out of the pharma industry. So the challenge for the pharma industry is what is it that we do better? And but then those generic drugs, what is the value proposition for the people with the health budgets? And it has to be those populations where we can show clearly that the efficacy and the safety and the benefit to patients is much better than we would get in the broad population. And those can well be those populations that we access using personalised healthcare and diagnostic tests. If, if you have a company like AstraZeneca who's willing to take it on, and there are other farmers doing it as well, I think that has to be the way forward. The idea that instead of, instead of looking at, we have an interesting molecule, what can we do with it? You actually have a situation in patients. This is how the cancers are changing. How can we stop it, as opposed to attack it, but it's often stop it. That's, that, that's a far more patient-centered approach. And, and I'm afraid politicians won't like it, but from the patient perspective, the money being spent is well spent if it helps more people survive cancer a little bit longer, or preferably a heck of a lot longer. All that presupposes that the drug development works, and, and our interest is that all the information about drugs that do go to trial is made available to other researchers. That's why patients do go into clinical trials. Of course, phase one trials, there's always the hope of the miracle cure. But actually what links us all, phase one, phase two, phase three, there is the knowledge that we are gonna do some good for somebody else. And that does mean that whatever comes from that trial should be made available and should be shared. That's absolutely something we subscribe to. Of course, we have, we have committed to transparency on all our clinical trials, and those trials are made available on our website. But I think what Rich is really talking about here is beyond that, the concept of taking drugs which maybe haven't been successful in our large clinical trials and making those available. So we have announced and have in, in process an open innovation with the Medical Research Council in the UK, the MRC, where we make available to researchers that they can try out these molecules, again, that have been tested in the clinic on really any patients that the physicians think are appropriate. We still have, if those are successful, we still have the option to take them back in. So it's really a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. We also have that situation with the, uh, with the NIH in the US and it's an area where I think not only AstraZeneca but other pharma companies will be doing more and more of this type of open innovation in the future. It has to come back to having the right diagnostics, doesn't it? It does, um, but it, it, it also, also giving the investigators some freedom to do these things that maybe there isn't a massive amount of data on. You know, that's one of the things that we've been working with FDA a lot on is for these investigator-sponsored INDs where they do want to go off, they sort of have a hypothesis, but maybe not a lot of data, is convincing the IRBs, convincing FDA that that's an acceptable way to go. And we have two, in some ways, quite different industries trying to converge here. What is the right timing for that kind of interaction? How do these industries work together to, to develop this process? 
we're still working on it. Uh, I think some of the pharmas have adopted the, um, the process of buying their own diagnostic companies so that they potentially have a little bit more leverage. Now that seems to get out of sync too. So you don't always see even drug companies that have diagnostic companies necessarily working with their own diagnostic companies. So, you know, you get into some interesting situations there. Um, but really, I think it's being willing to work together early on before anybody knows if there's commercial interest too. So I think we're still working on it, but I think everybody sees that this is going to be good for all of us in the end. And I think we're, we're trying to work on that. And I think actually we're going to eventually blend NB and industry. I think there will stop being this sharp, demarcation between pharma and diagnostics, I think we're going to become a biotech industry because I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's no longer a division. I think we, we're, we're going to blend eventually. How does that present itself in the clinic, Malcolm? Do you, do you see this as two very separate industries or do you see more collaboration between them? We see this, you know, that this space of personalised healthcare and diagnostics is really, you know, a, a fertile area for partnerships. Um, you know, both between commercial and commercial companies, or commercial and academic, commercial and university, it really, it really is is very fluid. It's very dynamic. It can be extremely synergistic. But providing we we think about bringing the biomarkers early enough to the to the process of, of development, providing that we um, have a, a relatively open, pragmatic approach to to sharing data and that we then design clinical trials that are adaptable, that, that can be iterative in, in terms of improving and following leads or closing down areas where we feel that investment is no longer required, then I think you know, we can bring success to, to what in a sense is a very um, diverse and somewhat complicated development process. And from your perspective, you know, would it be a would it be easier if perhaps diagnostics capabilities were held within pharma companies? No, I think there's I think there's space for, for a you know a, a plurality of, of, of provision. I think you know particularly in the pre-commercial space, then there's there's plenty of opportunity for you know commercial academic collaboration. Mm -hmm. Clearly, at the the late end when it needs to go out to the FDA and, and regulatory authorities, then you know that that merger, if you like, of, of biomarker test with um, therapeutic needs to be brought together and I think um, pharma and biotech industry will will have a, a you know a, an interdigitation that that moves and flexes apart over time but will ultimately come closer together well so we have we have looked at this many times and um, the, our conclusion has always been that we get the best flexibility through partnering with diagnostics companies but we do try to set up strategic alliances with those diagnostics companies as far as possible so that we're not bringing the company in at the last possible moment that does sometimes happen but it's much better as Maya said earlier if we can sit together right at the start of a project and look at the respective pipelines and see how those could work together. We do pay for uh, a lot of the development costs of the diagnostics company. Uh, when a drug fails in late phase and the diagnostics company is involved, if they've invested in that diagnostic and then they lose it through no fault of their own, um, that can be devastating for a small diagnostics company. So we do reckon to subsidise that. I think there's been a lot of interest in creative, I don't know if you call it financing or creative partnering in order to, <laughs> to make that work out for everybody. Um, I think some of these biomarkers and some of the things we've been talking about with tumors changing, I think that there will be tests that need to be done more frequently. You know, I mean, this was a huge change, for example, for HIV, when HIV monitoring came in. You know, that was really a perfect storm of not only an endpoint being available with that diagnostic, um, but really propelling the drugs and, and what was being developed there. And I think we are starting to see that with the tests as the mutations are changing, as, you know, things like that, where the tests do need to be performed more than just once to really find out what's going on with that patient. So I think as that part of this progresses, and I think we're still a little bit away from it, um, I think the diagnostic industry will be more interested and see the kinds of similar, maybe not 
amount of revenue, but maybe a similar arc in revenue as the, the pharma companies have. When it comes to healthcare systems and the payers within there, one of the challenges of personalised healthcare is you're now asking them to pay for potentially a drug and a diagnostic. Now, what's your sense on, have we got enough development there? Do payers understand the value of these diagnostics within systems? One of the challenges we have in the United States is the payers can't necessarily see what they're exactly paying for. Are they actually paying for the FDA approved tests? Are they paying for some kind of laboratory developed test? Is there anything the payers can do to insist upon the FDA approved test? So that's been one of the big discussions that have been, has been going on as well. I think the payers are trying often to do the best thing for patients and to, mm -hmm. to make sure they are getting the right therapies. Um, it's also in their interest not to have patients trying 10 different therapies. That's obviously a difficult mm -hmm. situation from a cost perspective as well. So, um, but I, I think it's coming together, but we're definitely, we've got a long way to go. The, the, the issue about diagnostic and paying for diagnostics, I think is, is interesting. Because again, if you look at the way we try to manage things in, in our country at the moment with a national health service, ultimately the bill for people who are sick gets paid for by the NHS. Yeah, we're, we're paying, it's not a health service, it's a service for people who are ill. Public Health England is now separating out the prevention side. But actually, to me, that's where we might be looking at some real cost savings in diagnostics. And it's in terms of diagnostics where it produces risk management and sensibly designed screening programs so that you can, you can actually start to filter some people out and you can actually start to deliver some interventions earlier, which, which may be quite cheap interventions. If you, if you look at diagnosis on the assumption it's going to find something which then needs an intervention, that's, that's one cost model. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you look at diagnosis in terms of prevention, risk management, there are then savings to it. And I don't think actually we have the, the model yet that will actually tease those out. So I, I, it's, it's, an, it's another one where I think we're on the cusp of something that will change significantly, yes. We have some situations where the payers are actually driving the discussion. So there was historically a case in the US where some personalized medicine advances were made in two drugs, I think for colorectal cancer, and though it was actually the payers that applied that first before the FDA actually approved them, because they refused to pay for those drugs unless the patient had the appropriate biomarker. Then of course you have the other side of it, which we've been re referring to, which is about payers wondering where this testing budget is going to come from, mm -hmm. and because Again, the reimbursement systems for testing are different. Every country you go into, then that's quite simple in some countries and very, very complex in other countries. Mm. I think, you know, just as in, in the past where we've come up against, you know, discussions about, you know, where, the, where funding in the UK should be applied to small increments in, in, in progression free survival or survival, we will come up against the same discussions with healthcare peers and, and so on, in and around the, the grey areas with biomarkers, and we probably then have both to, to contend with down the line. So I don't think that it's necessarily, you know, totally, um, you know, I don't think we're, we're not going to get away without those discussions being had.